Hi, everyone, and welcome to lecture six of ECE 3311, Principles of Communication Systems. Today, we're going to be talking about line codes. So line codes are a way of sending digital information um, in a baseband manner just by sending uh, rectangular shaped amplitude values over unit periods of time consecutively and each one of those um, sort of shapes, right, like rectangular shapes, uh, represents either a one or a binary one or a binary zero, okay? You might say, oh, okay, so what? There, it's easy, just send um, amplitude A for a one and zero for a zero. Mm, sure, you, you, you could do that, uh, but however, there are a lot of challenges associated with this, right? So what happens if, let's say your information has a lot of zeros, taking, for example, uh, what you just described, um, using a non-zero voltage level over unit time for a one and a zero voltage level uh, representing a zero. So what happens is suppose you let, um, you your data suddenly has a lot of binary zeros in it. The issue there is uh, your receiver potentially could lose sync in terms of where each bit period starts, right? Uh, so that's slightly unattractive, right? So you can't have that, the loss of synchronization between transmitter and receiver because you might be missing a bit or two. Um, on the other hand, if you choose something like A and minus A, where A is always, um, uh, uh, plus A is always one and minus A is always zero, now you run into the issue of constantly expending voltage, right, power, in order to communicate information. So what happens is people have come up with a variety of these line co codes in order to communicate binary ones and binary zeros, which we're gonna talk about right now. So here they are. So what you have um, are things like unipolar waveforms, bipolar waveforms, polar waveforms, and Manchester waveforms. So they each have a very particular shape, right? So the um, uh, unipolar waveform, the way it works is uh, if you have a one, you have a non-zero voltage level, positive voltage level. And if you have a zero, what happens is it's a zero voltage level, just like what we talked about before. Polar, on your hand, is the A and minus A, right? Plus A amplitude le level or voltage level. It represents a binary one. And a negative A, a negative voltage level, represents a zero. But you also have something called binary, a bipolar, or pseudo ternary, which is kind of interesting. Uh, this, this type of waveform actually has a memory associated with it, which is if you have a one, you either assume a positive amplitude or a negative amplitude, and it should be opposite of what the previous binary one value was. So if, let's say you had a binary one, A voltage, and then, oh, I have another binary one, negative A. Then I have another negative, uh, another binary one, A. So it alternates between every binary one value, even if there are zeros in between, it doesn't matter. It does this alternating business. And if it's zero, it remains, it's a zero amplitude level. Then finally, Manchester's is really cool wonky waveform that's kind of hard to describe, but I'm going to draw it. In fact, I'm going to draw all of these, but I also want to explain the terminology. So unipolar, just described it, either is amplitude A or zero, polar, amplitude A or minus A between a binary one and a binary zero representation. Bipolar, it does this alternation uh, of amplitude values when it's a binary one and it's zero otherwise. And then Manchester has this kind of really nice shape, which I'm going to explain in a minute. On the other hand, you also have return to zero and non-return to zero. And this too is kind of important because this allows you, if you want to save power, um, or get better sync um, it, by denoting where the boundaries are between different uh, periods, um, this is also very helpful. So a non-return to zero means that the amplitude value stays at that amplitude value throughout the entire period of that, uh, of that bit. On the other hand, return to zero means that somewhere during that bit interval, 
the value, the amplitude value, returns a zero for the remainder of the bit period. And we'll see all of this. So let's actually, let's do some drawing, okay? So I have this really cool drawing that I'm going to just articulate all the way through. So line codes. Okay. So first of all, we have unipolar non-return to zero. So first of all, suppose I want to communicate the information. One, one, zero, one, zero, zero, one. And this is the bit period, TB. Let me draw that a bit better. Okay. Then let me write these all out. Polar, non-return to zero. Unipolar, return to zero. Bipolar, return to zero and Manchester, which we'll see very soon. So if I had these folks, so here's the time axis for each one of these. Okay, the way this would look like is this. So I would either have a positive A value whenever a one occurs or a zero, right? For a unipolar. And, uh, and notice how, oops, and notice how during every period, my amplitude value is maintained at A. Polar on your hand, is either A or minus A if it's a zero. So it expends more energy than unipolar, where zero, uh, zero amplitude value means zero energy expended. So now, unipolar, the way this works is it also goes A, but not all the way. At some point, it goes down to zero. Oh, another one goes up to A, down to zero. Oh, it's zero, remains zero. A and zero for the remain, remainder of the cycle. Zero and then A goes down. And then same, and now here, bipolar, otherwise known as pseudo ternary, does this. So A and minus A. So let's say it starts off, the first guy is in A. And it goes down because it's returned to zero. Oh, it's a one again. Go to minus A and go back to zero. Oh, zero, nothing happens. Oh, it's a one again. And the last guy was a minus A. I'm going to be a plus A. Go down to zero, main zero. Oh, minus A. So that's pseudo ternary. And then last but not least, Manchester, it's either for a one high and low, high and low, but if you're zero, it's low and high. High and low, low and high, low and high, high and low. So that's Manchester, also between minus A and A. Okay, so that's line codes. And that's what you would communicate over a piece of copper wire or something between two, uh, two modems or something like that in computer communications or something. And, and again, um, this is separated by a steady, evenly spaced 
sort of bit period TB. Boop, 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 boop. And every period has a binary representation, either one or zero. Okay? Now, going back to the slides, that was the fun part of this lecture. And I think I just showed it. So, yay. So now, what I would like to do is dig in a little bit more and look at what happens if we want to mathematically describe the exact same thing. So the way that we would do this, okay, is we would use this signal model here, S of T. And S of T would have like, let's say, first of all, you have A of N, and A of N is representative of the amplitude value that is assigned to either a binary one or a binary zero. And F is the pulse shape. So we saw this, so let's, let's go back. So F could be one of several pulse shapes. So the non return to zero pulse shape would look like this from zero to TB and one, that's the not return to zero pulse shape. The return to zero pulse shape would be from zero to TB. It would have like, so let's say there's a 50% duty cycle, which means 50% of the time it's on. And then at TB over two, it goes off and it's amplitude one. And then let's say you have the Manchester one. you would have something that looks like this. Okay, one and minus one. And so that would be your base waveform, right? That would be F of T. And then if we go back to the slides, we would have shifted versions. Ah, yeah, so sorry. So TS and TB, exactly the same. Okay, so they're, they're equivalent. And you, we would have shifted versions of these and they would be shifted by integer multiples of the bit period. And it would be multiplied by the amplitude value that is representative of the binary digit being carried during that period. Awesome, right? So now, now that we have that signal model, that's really important. Because now what we wanna do is to calculate the power spectra. So in your textbook, you have these two expressions, equations two and equation three. And you might say, okay, really cool. That's nice, professor. But what happens is uh, to get to derive these expressions is quite laborious. Like I do not, I, I, I really do mean it. It's like crazy hard. So um, if anyone's interested um, the, um, in Cooch, Check out okay, and this will give you the derivations for equations Very important. So basically these guys, okay? So I'm not gonna derive them here. It'll take quite a bit of time. So here is the magnitude squared of the frequency response of whatever your basic pulse shape is. And then multiply by the sum of the autocorrelation multiplied by e to the j two pi k f t s. And then this r, this is the autocorrelation and I'll explain what that autocorrelation refers to in a minute, is represented by i is equal to one 
to big I, a n, a n plus k, i, p i. So what this autocorrelation means, okay, is the amount uh, of um, like what happens is these a's are the amplitude values. So what we're doing is we're taking every possible combination of amplitude value, correlating it, and then multiplying the the you know the likelihood that those two amplitude values will occur. Okay, by the probability of that scenario occurring, right? So let's let's look in. Let, let's let's for first of all, let's go back. Let's go back to the slides. But before I uh, before I do, these are these equations. If there's a walk away from this this lecture, is these two equations because in a minute we'll be doing deriving of the power spectral density of these line codes. So being mindful of expressions two and three, okay, these expressions come from pages 433 and 435 of the course textbook, okay? And again, um, it's quite intensive to derive them. This here, slide six, our final slide, is how we derive the power spectra for these line codes. So let's let's do an example. Let's do unipolar, okay? Unipolar non-return to zero using that expression. So let's let's go over. Let's do an example. And you should be, okay, for any class tests or anything in the future, you should be very comfortable to derive the power spectral density for any line code I send your way. Okay? So let's say we wanted to do the power spectral density of unipolar non-return to zero, okay? So what does that mean? A n is either a positive amplitude or zero, okay? We're gonna make the assumption that either one, binary one or binary zero is equally likely. Okay, so what does that mean? So let's go and use that expression, this guy here. So first, let's calculate him, right? So it's gonna be R of K is equal to Okay, so again, this guy here is some is a correlation operator. Okay, so we actually have two scenarios here. So what happens is we have when k is equal to zero. So let's look at that guy. So that means R of zero is equal to what? R of zero, we're gonna have two scenarios, right? We either have the situation of having the amplitude value, okay, of a binary one with the amplitude value of a binary one. So essentially that K, so we either have A N A N, now we have I, P I, which is going to be equal to A N, A N, one, P one, plus A N, A N, two, P two. So let's say the P one case, the I equals one case, is when we transmit a binary one. What do we have? So this guy's amplitude value is A. That's A. And what's the probability of getting an A value? What's the probability of getting an A value? It's a half, it's 50%. How about this? That's a zero, that's a zero, and that probability is also a half, but it doesn't matter because it's multiplied by zero. So at the end of the day, this R zero 
is equal to a squared half. Now, the other scenario, when the two are not the same, we have four possible combinations. Nikes. Okay. So what do we have? So we have the case when we have uh, here, um, we can either have A again, with itself. And remember, there are four cases, all equally likely. So they're each occurring with one quarter probability. We also have A times zero times a quarter plus zero times A times a quarter and then zero times zero times a quarter. So at the end of the day, we get A squared one quarter. So if we look at the autocorrelation function at the end of the day, we either have one half a squared or one quarter a squared when k is equal to zero or k is not equal to zero. All right. So now let's switch gears. This is non-return to zero, right? So what does our pulse shape look like? Our base pulse shape? It's a rectangular pulse. It's a rectangular pulse. So it's going to look like cool beans. Oh, by the way, the Fourier transform of that, of f of f, is going to be equal to t naught sine pi uh, pi f tb over pi f t b. Okay, great. So now what's interesting? What's interesting is now we plug all of this into the power spectral density general equation. So if we plug in the f of f and the r k, what we get is a squared tb over 4. That's the f magnitude, magnitude of f of f squared. And this guy here is that. So it's all plugging in. So now that we have this, remember this here is actually equal to 1 over Tb. Again, that, that, that conversion between sum of complex exponentials and a sum of delta functions. Okay, from minus infinity to infinity, f minus n t b. And what we see when we do this is now that we replace this, Okay, we have that. What, what is interesting about this? So this, okay, we have one. So we have a bias, right? 
And these guys occur, so that's, so this is a constant. And this are samples at, that occur at multiples of one over TB, okay, times N. How about this? It's a sync function. And guess what, folks? Zero crossings at multiples. Isn't that correct? Right? So the only place where the delta is not equal to zero is when n is equal to zero. Okay? So that's the only, so the only, the only time, okay, it, when, when we, we, like when we evaluate this, uh, this guy, right, what we get at the end of the day, so the rest of the deltas are just a pile of beans, right? Because what happens is those deltas don't make any impact because they occur the, you're, they're multiplying right at the inst, at the zero crossing instance of that sync pulse. So what we end up getting is the following. Uh, yeah. And that's squared. So we can ditch all the other deltas because they don't mean anything because they occur at the zero crossings. So we keep that. And so what does this look like? So what this will look like, so magnitude squared. So think about this way. So we have a magnitude squared and it's being multiplied by one plus a delta. So it's basically, it's being multiplied by a delta but that delta is also um, um, uh, has an additional one value added to it. So it's like a plateau. So what you end up getting is something that looks like this. Uh, trying to think, sync squared. and then you have a delta at the top. So that's what it should look like. I'm, I, it's, it's, I, I'm, I'm probably getting the, and see this is where, um, that's one over TB, two over TB, zero, minus one over TB, minus two over TB, right? And so that delta there, that's this guy, okay? So that, that's what your PSD is going to look like. So practice makes perfect. Try this out, for instance, with unipolar return to zero. Try this out with bipolar. Try this out with Manchester. Uh, see, and what's going to happen is there's going to be a number of variations. The big one you're going to discover is going to be that F of T. That waveform is going to change, and therefore your answers are going to change for, for the rest of your derivations. So hopefully, so the walk away from this lecture is understanding that there's a variety of different line codes, but more importantly, uh, your ability to take those line codes and be able to determine what their power spectral densities look like. And so this short example, what I just this, uh, described, uh, more or less is the process that you would use in order to solve all the other power spectral densities for those line codes. But of course, you know, the devil's in the details and you're going to have to work it out in order to get the exact answer. So that, that is lecture six of ECE 3311, the principles of communication systems.